we're going to uh, extend the, the ideas that we talked about last time, and that is the ideas of what ASP.NET controls are, and more importantly, what we started getting on the last part of the class uh, on Tuesday, is that we can program and we can do stuff with them. Because that's really where the fun starts, all right? You put these controls up there, again, it's nice that they do so much of the work for you, but the fun is that you can then take that and do something with it. So I'm going to have a, I have a couple examples uh, that I've thought of that we're going to go through and that we're going to work through, and uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes, all right? First example I want to give is I want to do a little quiz, a quiz web page, all right? And I want the quiz to look something like this. I want the question to be here. I want there to be some sort of control for the answer. It might depend on the question. The, 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 the control for the answer could be a drop-down if it was like a multiple choice question. It could be a text box if it was a fill in the blank question. It could be a check box if it was a true or false question, or even radio buttons if it was a true or false question. So we'll play around with a number of these uh, options for how to answer the question. At any rate, we're going to have a question, we're going to have an answer. We're going to have a submit button to get your answer graded. And then we're going to have a hint button in case you're not really sure and you want to take a hint. All right? Now, in our actual application, this stuff would be stored in a database. It would be a database table for the question, for the kind of question it was, whether it was true or false, fill in the blank, they'd be uh, a, a, stored in the database the correct answer. They'd be stored in the database what the hint was. All right? In our case, we're not quite, quite ready to that, uh, for that point. So we're just going to write a single question that we're going to hard code in. And just know later on this could be coming from a database. All right? Which you'd want to do, right? If you're thinking like if you had something like Angel, right? If, if I am making a test on Angel, I don't want to have to go and hard code an HTML page with all my questions. I want to be able to put the questions in the database and be able to uh, just randomly pick the question or whatever. By the way, I would be, I would be regretful if I did not mention the, the, fame, the, the great cartoon no, uh, news of the past week and your cup reminded me that Hello Kitty is actually not... That is not true. Okay, okay that is not true? We're not talking about that. We're not that. talking about that? Okay, fair enough. <laughs> what she, is, she is a cat. She can be whoever she oh, wants to be. Oh, yeah, her. She's not a cat. She's something yeah. else. Know, the, she's a little girl. Hello Kitty is, is a little, you know, the, the statement has been made and you can close your ears if you want for a second. <laughs> the Hello Kitty actually isn't a cat, but it's a little girl pretending to be. And and that has that has caused a great. Who cares? Some people people are really well, apparently some cares. people do. Who, you know, yeah. who cares about teenage ninja <laughs> mutant turtles too? But we had a whole classroom of people caring about that about ten minutes ago, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm never going to say who cares about something because if you looked at the stuff I'm interested in, you know, 95% of it, people are like, what? Why would you care about that? But at any rate, maybe that'll be one of the questions. What is Hello Kitty? <laughs> Just because she's a cat doesn't mean she can't be a cat. Just because she, she's, she has to be like emotionally like, upset about this. I right love Hello Kitty. Hello Kitty's big. Wow. Really big. Yeah. Boston, Japan mostly. All right. Whatever I want to wear, Alan. All right. Let's talk about what we're going to need for this. All right. What do we need to put the question in? Text box. Label. Or label. Label. Probably, yeah, we could do a text box, but we really don't want to because the user doesn't have to change it. So a label. Do we even have to do that? No. no. Why not? 
We could put it in a label. We could simply make a paragraph with a question in it. All right. This will be a variety of different things, right? It will be a text box that's fill in the blank question. And that'll be, for simplicity's sake, that'll be the first thing that we're going to do. All right, fill in the blank. This is going to be a button. This is going to be a button. They're both going to submit to the server, but it's going to do different things. One is actually going to grade the question and, and tell the user if they got it right or wrong. The other is going to display a hint. What's this hint going to be? What, what's it going to be stored in? What kind of control? Isn't that a validation? Well, no. The, the, there'll be validation on it, but the hint is like if you're not sure of the answer, you click the hint, it will pop up. Not that. really validation. How would they could be hidden on the page? A label, right. It would be hidden on the page initially, maybe. All right. Um, it could be in a label. Why do we make that in a label? And not the question. They're both just hard coded. It's a label you can set the visible. In. Right, because a label we want to program something with. We want to do something with it. All right. So therefore, we need an ASP.NET control that we could go and show or hide it. Now we could do this as a label. We could also do it as a panel. All right. What would be the advantage of doing it as a panel? You can have multiple controls. On. You can have a bunch of stuff that you hide and show. So, for example. The first question I thought of, and again, I, I, I hope there's no people that are going to argue with me about this, but there's liable to be, you know, when did Apollo 11 land on the moon? Right. And again, uh, if you don't believe that's true, just read the word allegedly in there. All right, because I don't, I don't feel like arguing this. But yeah, the correct answer is 1969. So I could, in the hint box, show the text that it was in the 1960s. I could show a picture of <coughs> the mission hatch. Yeah, the, the mission hatch or something like that. Or what I was thinking is maybe a picture of who would have been president then? Richard Nixon, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could show a picture of President Nixon and say, it was, it was, you know, it was after 1960, and this guy was president, and I have a picture of him. So with a panel, I could show and hide multiple things at once. I could do it without a panel, even if I did want to show and hide much, multiple things, but then I'd have to code each one individual, and if I added something, that could be awkward. Remember, almost everything we do in programming, um, we do because of maintainability. We do to make it easier to make a change to it once we do it. So by having a panel, we can just conveniently show, show and hide everything all at once. All right. We probably would want a validation on this. And in this case, we would want a required field validator to make sure they put something in. And we would want a numeric validator to make sure that it was um, a number. What other kind of validator might we want to put on here? I was sitting here thinking, like, in case somebody put in 1969 or versus 69, so if the answer was 1969, but they put 69, it would still technically be correct, so would you want to validate for something like that? Um, that way, 69 was still correct answer. That would be, be more the answer. You know, well, right? it depends how you want to handle it. What, what you're suggesting, I think, is if someone puts in 69, say, the year must be entered as a four-digit year. Right. All right, so that would be one way to handle it. The other way to handle it would be to accept 69 or 1969, and in which case that would be on the coding on the back end to, to say, hey, um, 1969, uh, you know, yes, you put in 69, it's actually 1969. Um, I would think that we've learned um, from the year 2000 Y2K business to do use for digit number, so we'll, we'll, we'll ignore that possibility. But a range validator is the, is the proper thing, yeah. you know. So what I could do, and again, that could, you know, prevent typos <coughs> if someone typed in, if someone intended to type in 1969 and typed in 1 and missed the 9 and typed in 169 uh, or whatever, it would catch that as well. So we could put a number of different validators on here. So let's, let's go and let's build this. And this will be a good opportunity for us to look at a bunch of different things. After we do this, we might change it up a little bit and change the answer 
to be um, a, a checkbox, not a checkbox in this case, but a radio button or a drop down or something like that. So let's go and let's build this. And we're going to go over how to create the, the page, and later on I'll go over how to open it back up once you have created it. At least it only takes me a minute now to realize that all the stuff's on the other side instead of five minutes like the first couple days of class. If you want to hit the lights, that might help a little bit. Yeah, the, yeah, the door too would be great. All right, I'm going to open up Visual Studio. Again, I'm going to show you the way that I think is the easiest to do this. This might be a little different than how you do things like, for example, if you make a C-sharp application, but for websites, this works just fine. This is a problem with the deep freeze software, is every time you're doing it, it thinks it's the first time you're opening Visual Studio, so it has to do stuff, I think. Is there a way to have Visual Studios automatically put in the coding so that the website works across the board? So it works on Internet Explorer, Firefox, all that, or do you have to physically go in and do the coding yourself so it will automatically change you know, that shift thing? Repeat that? That shift thing that makes sure yeah. it's hard for Explorer. Yeah, yeah keep, well, keep in mind, to, to answer that question, no. That's kind of like saying, is there a hammer that can make a cabinet that is earthquake proof that won't fall over. No. All right. The tool doesn't do it. You do it. All right. Um, in a perfect world, the controls would be such that they would lend themselves to that. All right. Um, however, you can't count on that. It's your responsibility to, to, uh, to, to ensure that that happens. And therefore, again, keep in mind, we're making web pages here. All right. We're doing all the stuff that we did if you had CISS 216. The difference is, is we have a collaborator. We have ASP.NET Framework that's doing some of the work for us. All right. Now, to your point, you mentioned the HTML5 shiv, which is a little snippet of JavaScript that you can go to make things compatible with earlier versions of Internet Explorer. There's a little Firefox fix style sheet that you can put in. Given that we're just making HTML pages, you can put all those things in, all right, and, and you should. But again, you know, it, it's not, how, how do I want to say it? The best you can hope for is that it doesn't deliberately break Firefox or whatever, and it's your job to sort of sure, ensure that, that what you make is compatible. So I'll go up here and I'll say File. new website not project but website all right gonna click the Visual Studio we're gonna keep it on empty website and we're gonna put it somewhere that we can find it later on and I'm going to put it on the desktop. <clears throat> and we'll call it quiz. It'll tell me I'm creating a folder. I'll say yes. Then I'll click OK. And we will have Again, an empty website, a website that only contains um, the two web config files, and, uh, and that's it. Now, 
Before I burn myself on something I did last time because I forgot, I'm going to go and I'm going to put the snippet of code in that will allow the validation to work. All right. So I'm going to go and you think after all this time I would have that snippet of code memorized, but I don't. So I'm going to go and copy from our example last time that little snippet of code. This it is. Copy that. Put it in my web config file. And I am good to go. So we need to do this if we're going to run our web pages here. You need to do this if you're going to valid if you if you're going to validate in the manner which I'm going to validate the page. I would simply just, you know, go to the, the thing and, uh, you know, copy and paste it from that example that we did last time. All right. So, I'm going to build my page. I'm going to close out a web config. And... I'm going to go File, New, File. And I'm going to pick an ASPX page, which is a web form. <clears throat> By default, it gives me the name default.aspx, which is good, because the first page of your application, the home page, should be called default.aspx. Um, I am always going to make sure Visual Studio, or I'm sorry, Visual C Sharp is, is checked. And I'm also going to make sure that it says place code in separate file. In my mind, you really lose a lot of the advantages of ASP.NET if you put all everything in one place. I, I think that the separation of it is critical, and um, I, I think it makes for much cleaner code um, and allows the ability for collaboration, whereas one person that has visual design skills can work on the presentation in the ASPX file, and another person that has coding skills can work on the coding part in the um, code behind file. Recommend just like standard like MVC or repeat, please. Like standard MVC, like model view controller. Well, this is the slightly different. The the web forms approach is, is different than the full blown ASP.NET model view controller. Okay. I mean, it incorporates aspects of it in so far as there's a separation between that, but it's not the there there is a style of doing ASP.NET that uses model view controller. Okay. Uh, much more uh, much more rigorously. All right. So now when I do that, I have a blank page that I can view any number of ways. I can view the code. I can view the graphical view or the design view. And finally, I can view split, where I see some of each.
One thing, again, that I mentioned last time is that there's a lot of options on how you can style stuff. My preference is that you, again, follow good practices and do it via external CSS pages as opposed to putting the styles as part of the ASP.NET control. The problem with that, again, is you're really no better off than using font tags or something like that because you have to go back and change it on every individual page if something about the, the layout scheme or, or the, the appearance uh, changes. All right, so I'm going to go and make a CSS file. And I'm not going to do tons with the CSS, but I'm going to do it just to, um, just to demonstrate how you make a CSS file. All right, so uh, again, we'll, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do this just, just to, 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 you know, spruce up the appearance a little bit. For your assignments, your pages are expected to look like a completed professional web page. Do keep in mind when I'm doing examples in class, um, this is not a class in CSS, so I'm not going to spend tons of time making the pages look good. But I do want you to do that. I want you to practice that and, uh, again, especially if you've had CISS 216 before and you, you're familiar with this, this is a good opportunity for you to practice these skills. So I'm going to go and I'm going to make a new file. I'm going to make a style sheet file. And I'm just going to do a couple very basic things. I will make the background color We even have a color picker here. I never saw that before either. I'll be darned. I still use the wheel that you showed us in HTML. Yeah. That's well, really nice. I like picking colors. <laughs> it's more fun. Somebody broke into a dopey's pad. Let's make it use that. <laughs> All right. And we'll use black as the text. Now, uh, I'm just going to do something. I'm going to give a div. I'm going to put a margin 10px <coughs> auto. And with fifty percent and border one px white solid. What's the auto portion? What the auto will do is it will center it. Uh, remember that in CSS, um, where you have four properties like this, because really the margin is four properties. There's a margin top, there's a margin right, there's a margin bottom, and there's a margin left. If you specify two of them, it repeats it. So the top margin will be 10px. The right margin will be auto. That means figure out to center it, essentially. Oh, okay. The bottom margin will be 10px, and then the left margin will be auto. So it automatically figures out the margin to make it so that it's 50% and it's even on both sides. So if you put auto first, it would make the top and bottom automatically center out? I've never, I've never done that. You could try it. Okay. All right. Now I have to go and I have to apply that style sheet. So... Put that in, link, um, So now if we view this in graphical view, we should see there is the 
green page, there's the div with the border around it. All right, we're ready to go. All right, let's go in here and let's put some of the stuff in here. We don't have to do all of it at once. Let's do a piece of it. Um, <clears throat> I'm a firm believer, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this over and over again throughout class, that one common mistake I see students make is trying to do everything all in one shot. It's like they have a project to do, they want to get it done, which yeah, I can respect that, you know. But they try to do it, like they try to hit the home run and sit down and bang out the solution from beginning to end. Um, the problem with that is if it works, you're, it's great and you're done. If it doesn't work, you can be searching like for the proverbial needle in a haystack. Who knows where you made the mistake, you know. It's easier to find a problem in five lines of code than it is in 50 lines of code. So if you do a little tiny piece, test it, make sure that it works, add something to it, test it, make sure that it works, and sort of repeat that cycle, if you get to a point where something doesn't work, you can be pretty sure, not 100% sure, but you can be pretty sure the last thing you did is what messed it up. On occasion, there are problems that you create that don't come out until later on, but most of the time, you can probably assume, hey, that last thing I added is messed up, all right? Plus, I think it's better for your attitude. Instead of having a giant mess of a program that doesn't work, it's better to have a program that does half of what it's supposed to do, but that half it does perfectly. You can then quit and come back to it the next day and, and finish it off. So I'm going to put in here the question. I'm just going to put it in a plain old paragraph. When did Apollo 11 land on the moon? And again, I am going to pop back and forth between graphical view and um, uh, code view. It's good to know both of them. All right? It's good to be familiar with both of them. Sometimes it's easier to do stuff in graphical. You know, I'll admit to it, just to drag a control on and let it go. But sometimes you want the detail of seeing actually what the actual code is. All right? Especially when things break. Remember, the purpose of a GUI is to hide things for you, to make things easy for you. And us as software developers, we want to know the nuts and bolts, and we want to be able to see the nuts and bolts to try to figure out uh, a problem. So let's go in and let's add a button. All right. And let's add a, whoa, that was bad. And let's go and add a label for an indication whether this is correct or not. All right. Let's look at this in graphical view. All right. I'm going to go make a couple tweaks to this. I'm going to start out with no text in the label. And I'm going to change the button to say submit answer. And I think I forgot the text box. One thing that I have a bad habit of doing, again, I, I, I'll try to excuse it by saying in the interest <coughs> of time uh, I do this, but um, it's probably good to go and rename your text boxes and labels and all that to something that reflects what they truly mean as opposed to just leaving them as text box one, button one, label one. All right. Um, it's all well and good in a form like this. I only have one text box. It would be pretty hard for me to be confused about what the meaning of that text box is. But if I had a larger form that had dozens of fields in it, um, I don't want to be sitting there thinking, now text box 97, was that the date or was that <coughs> the um, address? You know, I, I want to know for sure. So I'll try to be 
try to remember to do this as often as I can and call this um, appropriate name. So I'll say text answer button submit and label results. Um, it's also good to keep a standard as far as what you call things. So for example, all your text box maybe start with the word text or txt or something like that. Again, the compiler doesn't care about that. You could call it anything you wanted and it would sort it out. All right. But by having some consistency, it helps you at a glance to know what's going on. Remember, all these things that we do are for your benefit, to make it easier to change and easier to maintain. Okay, so I'm going to run it just to make sure that the visual aspect of it is correct, and we'll come back and we'll actually make this work by putting something in the code behind. There we go, and the visual aspect of it works, but we're not really doing anything when we click the submit answer. We are sending it to the server, you can tell that because this blinks a little bit, but since we don't have any code, nothing happens. All right, let's go and let's make something happen on the code. And so I want to get into the code behind, so I can double click the code, or the button, and I'm in the code behind. And it's smart enough to know that what I want to code is the button click event for this. I want the button click method. Let's go back and look at the actual button control. And let's look at the code view. This is something that you don't easily get from the design view. If I look at the code view, I'll see that it is assigned an on-click event as button submit underscore click. And this control is to be run at server. So what that means is when this is clicked, this function, this method, fires <coughs> off on the server, when it makes it back to the server, that is. And given that this is a submit button, it will make it back to the server. Why do I point this out? I point this out because from time to time, depending on how you create things and the sequence and if you rename things or whatever, sometimes there's a disconnect between this, the control, which has is on click event, and the method over here. So if you have an event that doesn't seem to be firing off, make sure your control knows that that is the event, that that, that function is the code that ought to be called when that event occurs. All right. Now, in this one it's pretty easy, so I'm just going to put if, if what? If text answer dot text equals 1969 then I'm correct otherwise I'm incorrect. I could put some comments in here with the two slashes. Check to see if user entered correct answer.
I had a, a colleague that said that you should put the comments in before you do any coding. And that's actually a good strategy. That's a good strategy for a couple reasons. First of all, a lot of people will say, I'm going to leave and I'll get the comments later, and that later never happens. All right, they, they get it working, they're so filled with elation and glee that they upload it and never come back to put the comments back in. The other thing, by putting the comments in, it sort of shows a level of planning, that you've thought through how this procedure is going to work, that first you're going to do this, then you're going to do that. If you can't write the comments for how you're going to do something, there's no way you're going to write the code to be able to do it. All right? Because with the code, not only do you have to know what to do, but you have to know the right <coughs> syntax to do it. So if you haven't figured out the right thing to do yet, you're going to be really, you're behind the eight ball. You want to be able to fight only one battle at a time. So figure out what you're going to do, then figure out how to do it. The other thing I would say about comments is that your comments shouldn't exactly, shouldn't, shouldn't merely um, describe what the statement does, but instead it should put it in a, in a, from the perspective of what that really means. For example, this wouldn't be a good comment. Compare the text property of text answer with the string 1969. Well, yeah, of course it, that's what it's doing, right? Anyone that knows C sharp knows that that's what that line does. That doesn't put it from the perspective of like what this is actually doing. What am I doing? I'm checking to see if this is the right answer. All right, so don't simply explain what the code does, but explain the significance of the code. What does that, why are you doing this particular line? All right, so if it's correct, what do we want to do? Put a label that it was correct. Sure. So I will say label results. And again, that's the nice thing of using the convention. If I know I start all my labels with the word label, I can just type LAB and it will show me the list of things. Label results text equals Correct. <coughs> All right. So now let's run it and make sure that this is working. All right. When did Apollo 11 land on the moon? I will type in 1969. Submit answer. Correct. I'll put something else in. Incorrect. All right, so it works. Now, from a technical perspective, this works. But if you think about it, I might want to give different feedback if they're correct versus incorrect as far as the visual presentation goes. Maybe, for example, in addition to saying correct or incorrect, I would want to display an image, maybe a check mark versus an X. At the very least, I would want to possibly use a different style. Maybe correct I put in, you know, big uh, bigger characters and, and um, you know, what would be a good color for this? Blue or, or black, let's say. Maybe for incorrect, I want to put it in italics and red or something like that. Let's say I want to do that. Let's think for a minute. Let's say if they're correct, I want to display the characters um, in black <coughs> and bold. If they're incorrect, I want to show it in red and italics. How could I do that? 
through CSS, that's part of the answer. So what would I do? Would you create some sort of uh, uh, make a div container for it and then give it an ID name so you can manipulate it in CSS? Okay. So I could, first thing I could do is I could make sure that there's an ID on that. Okay? Because if there's an ID on it, I can manipulate it in CSS. All right, that, that's one approach I could take. Um, I could take a slightly different approach, though. Yes? I don't know if this might be stupid, but um, like a if, if statement in CSS file? It won't, the if statement won't be in a CSS file. Oh, okay. CSS files don't have if statements, but what could I do in, in there? I could create two classes, right? And this is why the ID doesn't really, after I thought about it for a second, probably isn't the best. You don't want to create a, a class. A, an ID, you want to create a class. In fact, you want to create two classes, right? A correct class and an incorrect class. Right, so let's go in here and let's say a class of correct color black. So there I have the class of how I want it to look if it's correct. So I'll create an incorrect one and I will say color red font dot style I think. Yeah, there we go. So, I have my two classes in there, all right? And I could, I could assign a class to that, all right? How do I assign now the proper class? Where do I put the code in to assign the proper class depending on whether it was correct or incorrect? Within the same if statement I have here. So I could say I already have an if statement to check to see if they're right or not. What do I want to do? Well, I've set one property of that text box, or I'm sorry, label, right? I set the text property. There's another property on here for class name, and I could set the class name for that label and apply the correct class depending on um, whether they were right or not. So if they were right, I can say label... Results dot CSS class equals what do I call it? Correct, I think. And then I can do incorrect. So now let's make sure that this works. I type in 1969. Correct, and it is in bold and black. If I type in another answer, red and italics. The point of this shows, again, what I want to show is I want to show that anything that's on any of the attributes of any of the controls that we can set via the IDE that we can set and give an initial value to any of those properties we can change programmatically all right so not only can I change the text of that label I can change the style that's applied to that label I could change any of the properties of that label. Let's look at what all the properties are and let's see if any of them look like they'll be fun to do. <coughs> oh, 
or really not much on a label. But through our style, we have a lot of versatility that we could do. Questions up to this point? Yes? Um, if we were going to use a picture that would pop up after you put a correct or incorrect um, answer, would that go on this page then? Okay, that's a good question. Let's, let's, let's do that. That's a good one to add. Let's say I want an image, a, a correct image and an incorrect image. All right? So, um... paint anywhere on here. Let's paint ourselves an image. All right, here we go. And there we go. All right, um, let's make a smaller image than this. Let's make it this big. How do I Let's keep it real simple here. <coughs> this is the wrong answer. <laughs> yeah, that's simple. Right, exactly. <laughs> So I'll put this on my desktop and I'll call it wrong. I'm making it a PNG not because um, um, uh, not because I'm actually going to do this, but with a PNG I could make the background color of it transparent. So this is going to this I believe is going to show me a white square with a red X <coughs> in it. But if I wanted to take the time with a PNG file, I could make it so that it was simply a red X floating there. Yes. When you add the image, sorry if I'm getting a little head up, if, when you add this image, do you recommend dragging and dropping an image through the um, toolbox, or do you recommend adding it through the HTML <coughs> as in href? Do you know what I mean? Or uh, not an href? Does it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter? No. Is it easier to manipulate if you drag and drop the image in? Well, okay, keep in mind that that that's sort of a moot point, right? Because if you drag it in and you decide you want to manipulate the code, you can just switch to the code view. Oh, there's a picture box control and add it to the picture. Right. But what, what as far as, like, because if you add it as a CSS, or not CSS, but in HTML, you have to save the image into where the file location is. So if I were to click it, if I were to drag and drop it in, does it automatically store it in its own memory, or do I still have to create an image file? Do you know what I mean? Is Not it's, really. It's You'd still, you still have to have an image file, and it still has to be in a place that can be accessed by the web application. Okay. All right, let's go and let's save this as correct. And I just messed up. So I have a right and wrong PNG file that's on the desktop. It needs to be accessible to my web application. So I'm going to drag them into the main folder. So I now have, as part of the applications folder, I have the right and wrong PNG file. All right. So I'm going to go, and we could do this a couple different ways. I'm going to go and I'm going to add a image here. We can look at, and again, I dragged and dropped it, but we can look at the code here. All right. And I can make that initially invisible 
That way I won't see anything when the question first displays. Okay? So I have an image there, and that image is a placeholder. I'm going to, after they've answered the question, I'm going to make it visible, and then I'm going to put in either the correct or the right.png or the wrong.png, depending on whether they were right or wrong. Okay, so let's look at how to do that. Yeah, I probably should change the name of it to image results, let's say. No, because because this image, yeah, this image is going to both hold the correct image and the incorrect image. There's only one image on this. And I'm going to swap out the URL that belongs in that image. All right. So I'll go here and say, first of all, I'm going to say image results dot visible. equals true. Alright. Then I'm going to set the URL for it. Well, what's the URL for it? I don't know. But I know this. I know that this is an ASP.NET component. One of the properties for an image is going to be the URL for the image, the, the file name for the image. All right. This is what becomes a giant part of your struggle as a developer. Not struggle, but your job as a developer. You have these controls, and you know that you can manipulate them. Well, how do you do that? All right. An image is going to have a URL associated with it. So the question is, how do I find what that property is? And that's where IntelliSense comes in handy. All right. And if I look here, image URL is the name of the image that I want to display. So if they're correct, I want to display right.png in that image. If they are incorrect, I want to display wrong.png. All right? Let's test it. Notice again, as I'm doing this, I'm doing a little thing at a time. I, I did the right and wrong. Then I changed the style on it. Now I'm adding the image on it. Next thing I would do, and either we'll do it today or we'll do it next time, will be to add validation on it add the hint box to it, and so on. All right, so let me run this. Incorrect, and oh, that doesn't... That you doesn't. want the image before the visibility, don't you? No. Don't you want to set the you image, want the image file in the same folder as the project? Yeah, and I thought it was. Yes, it should be. And you know what? Here's how we're going to troubleshoot this. How are we going to troubleshoot this? Go view the source. Right. We're not going to sit and speculate. All right. We're going to view the source and see what really got put out there. So the source of this image is wrong.png. All right. Refresh the solution explorer. Refresh the solution explorer? Oh, maybe we will sit and speculate. Yeah. Ah. Where are we looking at? Oh, I put them in the wrong, I put them in Wednesday's exam, or on, uh, on Tuesday's example. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Do keep in mind, any of these mistakes I made are to check to see if you're paying attention. So everyone gets five points off because you gave me wrong answers. All right, I'll make a note here. Well, that's what we're going to do when we're programming anyway. So. 
Okay, right. <laughs> now, right, now, right, now, right now, now, well, let me try without refresh because I'm pretty sure it will work anyhow. It just won't show it in the Explorer, but all right. So I go in here and I type in. 1969 and I get the answer and it's marked correct. I typed in something else what a good check mark. and what a good check mark and what a good X. One thing notice uh, again just because we're in an ASP.NET class doesn't mean you forget everything that you learned about NCISS 216 and, and about general web development if you've had that class. So for example notice that I made the answer red, but I also made it in italics. And I, I threw up a graphic there as well. And in the other case, I uh, made the answer bold and the color of the font was black. Why did I do the multiple ways of showing whether they've gotten it right or wrong? So we could see the difference. <laughs> so you could see the difference, so true. Accessibility. And, and largely for accessibility. For example, if someone, if I simply displayed the answer as I did before, where I said correct or incorrect, all right, um, that wouldn't give enough of a visual cue. You'd have to actually stop and read, oh, incorrect. If I just made the color different, someone that's colorblind and couldn't distinguish the colors would be no better off than just plain old text. So I went and I did a couple of different things to give the message. So even, you know, you, know, e e you know, if you were, for example, colorblind, you could see the X. You wouldn't necessarily know that it was a red X, but you could see the X and know that that means incorrect. Plus, visually, you see that the, the font is in italics as opposed to bold. If you were dyslexic and you had uh, trouble with certain letters, all right, the X in the check would give you some sort of visual cue as well. If you were blind and your screen reader read it to you, well, the fact that there's a check mark and an X doesn't mean anything to you, but it could read the verbiage correct or incorrect. So the hope is that we'd have all our bases covered so by doing it this way. Put an alt text on yeah, I, I, I should put an alt attribute. In fact, this is an object-oriented world, right? We should be able to refer to the property alternate text <coughs> equals of that. The reason we're going through this again is remember going back to the first days of class where we talked about the process by which dynamic pages are generated and we talked about specifically in ASP.NET you have these ASP.NET controls that when the server does their thing on them it produces HTML. So the server-side controls along with your code is composing the HTML on the fly. You're writing the directions to compose that HTML. What is the implication of that? The implication of that is these controls are going to translate into HTML. Therefore, anything about the HTML that we want to manipulate one way or another, we can do so simply by accessing the properties of that ASP.NET control. So I want to set the alt attribute of the image. Well, Find the proper property of this image control that sets the alternate text, and that's the one that you need to change. I want to change the actual image file. Find the property that relates to that and change it. I can do anything I want to to this page as long as the control has the property to control that. And I can set these properties initially. All right, I can give initial values for some of these properties. But I could also dynamically through my code and conditionally change them to be what I want it to be. All right. Later on, for example, when we have uh, when we integrate with a database, 
all right? We're going to pull the names of images from a database table and use that to display the proper image. So you could have a list of employees and a, a picture of each employee. You would have in the database then the name of the image. And then based on the database query that returns the name of the image, we're going to set an image control to use that as the image to be displayed. Questions over any of this? We sort of took a diversion, but that's okay. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit more about this. So what next week we will do is we will add validation to it because I left the validation off. Sometimes I leave the validation to last simply because it's convenient then for me not to have to take the time to type in a properly formatted answer. I can just bang on the keys to enter in an incorrect answer to see what it does. Uh, but at any rate, we will add validation to this and we'll add the business of the hint um, to this as well. We'll then also go and play around with the um, to change this, maybe make it a multiple choice question instead of a fill in the blank question. All right. What view are you in right now? Is that a dot CS view? I am. I am. Be, okay. Because the dot CS file is a code behind file, there is no visual view of a code file of of the code behind file. So with the with the dot CS file, the 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 C sharp code behind file. All I get is the code view. So that's the only view I can see. So it's, it's a .cs file. .cs file. With every page, if you check that little box that says put the code in separate file, with every web page that you get, you get an ASPX page, which is the <coughs> visual aspect of it. You get the .cs page, which is the C sharp code behind for it. So when I created that page, I didn't see it because that was, was uh, not expanded, but associated with a web page, with an ASPX page, there is also a code behind page. And that code behind page is what allows us to go and access and do stuff dynamically with the controls that are on the ASPX page. You know, you can also see where that is, what you're on by that bar up there, where it's highlighted, it's a default ASPX.CS. And you can click on those tabs to go between them if you right, want to. I just can't read that. Uh, right. You can't right, right. read it, but right up there, see when you're on the page. Right. That'll show you what view you're, what, 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 page, what actual file, what file you're, you're looking editing. at. Correct. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, in the beginning of class, someone had brought up the, uh, the shift for making this mm -hmm. uh, friendly among other browsers. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's code that you had uh, available to the show or if you had to dig it out of the picture. Um, it, it's nothing that I wrote. If you simply Google. JS file. Yeah, H. Just link Google, uh, Google hosts the if you just Google HTML5 shiv. Right there. Essentially, the, the, what, this, what this does is that earlier browsers, you know, didn't understand HTML5 because HTML5 was in the process of being developed. And the <coughs> browsers were written before HTML5 was at a certain point. So certain versions of Internet Explorer don't get HTML5 tags. Now there's nothing that you can do to make a page to make a page fully compatible with earlier versions, but the main new tags in HTML5 are the section and the article and the nav and the head header and the footer and the aside. What the HTML5 shiv does, and there's also a Firefox um, CSS file that you can use as well, is it at least makes the browsers understand that those are block tags. That's all that it does. So it's not like, boom, you're going to have HTML5 compatibility. No. It tells it that those, those main structural tags, treat them like divs. You know, make them block tags. So, again, that's the purpose of... Uh, 
uh, of that little snippet of code that you can put in. And there's something comparable in Firefox where essentially you declare all the new elements and you simply say that they're block tags. So that's just kind of verbatim what, what, what we had in mobile in terms of that actual chunk there. That was the same. Absolutely. I mean, you're still making web pages, right? You know, the, the, the fact that they're being made through the, 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 the web server doing some more work and processing these server-side commands and controls is irrelevant. What's getting delivered to the browser is still a package of HTML. So yeah, absolutely, it's, it's the exact same thing. Other questions? All right, we will see you sideways in lab. Well, it's on the same floor. Usually I say we'll see you down in lab.